Father, the Trinity, one God. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Glorious festival of Pentecost. Pentecost. It's one of my very favorites. Well, along with Christmas and Epiphany and Easter and Ascension and All Saints, all of the feasts, the great feasts of our tradition. Before I share with you what I think is central to these scriptures from for Pentecost, I'd like to set them in context for the sake of biblical learning and literacy. This first reading is from the Hebrew scriptures from the time after Moses has led the people of God out of Egypt. They assemble at Mount Sinai where they are giving Torah, given Torah, the law, the Ten Commandments, and they are instructed in the building of the tabernacle, a portable tent of meeting to be the designated place of God with them as they wander toward the promised land. The journey is difficult. And Moses is often frustrated and discouraged. So in this reading from Numbers, God is helping him delegate authority. But it's not ordinary leadership that is being bestowed. God confers God's spirit given to Moses on 70 others. They are, in fact, ordained. As in the church to this day, ordination is the sacramental conferring of the Holy Spirit upon God's people for God's work and purpose on earth. More about that later. But there is this interesting twist. While 68 of Moses' chosen leaders are where they are supposed to be, two of them are still in the camp. And when the Spirit is given, it is given to them also, even though they are not out at the tent of meeting. Are they sick? Didn't they get the email? Or are they not following directions? Apparently, that's what the young cattletail thinks. And so does Moses' assistant, Joshua. My Lord Moses, stop them. But that's not what Moses thinks. Are you jealous for my sake? Asks this true leader who has talked with God face to face. How wonderful it is that God gives God's spirit so freely. I wish all of God's people would open themselves to receive his spirit and the actions God calls them to, says one of these. It's radical inclusion. Chronologically next, although hundreds of years later, the gospel, the gospel lesson from John takes place during the, during the course of Jesus' ministry, before his arrest, crucifixion, and resurrection. Jesus has come to Jerusalem for the feast of the tabernacles. John, intentionally, I believe, situates this part of Jesus' story in relation to the wandering in the desert and the episode from Numbers. The giving of the Holy Spirit to those chosen by Moses to carry on with them God's work in forming the Israelites into God's people. By the time of Jesus, the Feast of Tabernacles had become one of the primary holy days in Judaism. At this feast, water played an important symbolic role as the people remembered the way God provided water for them in that barren wilderness of wandering. And this is a quote. According to the Mishnah, a temple priest would draw water from the pool of Siloam with a golden pitcher, then carry it back to the temple accompanied by musicians and pour it into a silver bowl next to the altar. In some rabbinic traditions, the water drawing of the Feast of Tabernacles is interpreted as the expression of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus takes the symbolism much farther. On this last, most important day of the festival, Jesus proclaims. He cries out, the scripture says, and the proclamation is an invitation. Come. Come, thirsty one empty, burdened ones. All of you who have found 
at your own desires, addictions, expectations, demands, successes, failures, leave you unfulfilled. That's all of us. Thirsty enough to receive that's radical inclusion. Come drink, because my spirit is living water that will well up from your deepest selves, your heart, your center, and bring you wholeness, peace, hope, and joy. Remember Jesus promised to the disciples that we talked about last week the incredible power of the fullness of joy. That's what happens on Pentecost. Jesus has been glorified in his death and resurrection, glorified in that he has poured out his own life, he, one with humanity, in order to bring us into oneness with himself and thus with God. He has poured himself out in utter self-giving love, God's power poured out on all who accept and receive it. So we have this dramatic expression of wind and fire and water all long associated with spirit and language. We read that the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each heard him speaking in the native language of each. Did the disciples suddenly find unfamiliar words coming out of their mouths, words given by the Holy Spirit? Surely possible. Or maybe as they talked about Jesus, their beloved, their friend, their glory, their joy, their power, the message was so big, so important, as to be understood by everyone who was there as deeply and unambiguously as in the language they learned from their, their mother tongue. Because the message of God is for everyone. Radical inclusion. This is the thought I wanted to share. The love of God in Christ is for everyone. It is the expression of radical inclusion. Radical. Radical. Down at the very roots. The message of Pentecost is that in Jesus, in the church of Jesus Christ, there can be no exclusion of anyone. Gay, straight, trans, dirt poor and filthy rich, elegantly clothed and tattooed, in power and in prison, emotionally secure and emotionally needy, all human. In our small selves, so quick to make judgments, so quick to take offense, so much at the mercy of our social learnings and dominant culture inputs, we can hardly comprehend such radical inclusion. But the power of Pentecost can be as transformative for us as it was in Jesus' first disciples. This is the, the inclusion at the root of the cosmos. <clears throat> My soul this morning, this orange side, is because orange is the color for Gun Violence Prevention Sunday, which is today. But the other side has these swirls and sparkles and, and, and cosmic things. <laughs> and so that's why I'm talking about this inclusion, an inclusion that is at the root of the cosmos, the love mediated by the Holy Spirit, the love in which we ourselves are included, the inclusion that was manifested in language that day. My commentator friend Debbie Thomas writes, languages carry the full weight of their respective cultures and histories, psychologies, and spiritualities. To speak one language as opposed to another is to orient oneself differently in the world, to see differently, hear differently, 
process and punctuate realities of the faith, to speak across barriers of race, ethnicity, gender, religion, culture, or politics, is to challenge stereotypes and risk ridicule. To attempt one language as opposed to another is to make oneself a learner, a servant, a supplicant. It is a brave and disorienting act. Has there ever been a time when we have needed such brave border crossing acts more acutely than we need right now? As the world grows more and more tribal, as nations, cities, and even faith communities turn on each other out of suspicion and selfishness, as we've been forced by the pandemic to physically separate from those around us, can it be that God desires to pour out the Holy Spirit on us so that we might learn new and life-giving ways of being the church, being his body, being love incarnate for a frightened and imperiled world? What languages do we need to speak right now that we've never spoken before? Where does the fire need to fall to burn away all that hinders us from being bearers of good news in this dark time? That's Heather Thomas. Bearers of good news in this dark time. Remember hearing at the beginning of these reflections that God's Spirit was shared from Moses to Eldad and Medad and their 68 fellow Israelites in the wilderness. And I said that they had been ordained, that ordination is the sacramental confirming of the Holy Spirit on God's people for God's work and God's purpose on earth, and that I'd get back to that. Well, guess what? If you have been baptized, you are ordained. You have been ordained, whether as an infant or an adolescent or an adult. In an Episcopal church or in another tradition, you, as much as any deacon, priest, or bishop, have been ordained for God's work and purpose on earth. Did you know that? Deacons, priests, and bishops take differing vows differing responsibilities, but we all, all of us, at baptism, take upon ourselves the baptismal vows. We hear this from the liturgy of baptism. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by water and the Holy Spirit you have bestowed upon these your servants the forgiveness of sin and have raised them to the new life of grace. Sustain them, O Lord, in your Holy Spirit. Give them an inquiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and to love you, and the gift of joy and wonder in all her creation. Amen. And you are sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. This giving of the Holy Spirit, this ordination in baptism, is to fill you with the power of joy in order that you may be bearers of good news in this dark time. The joy is to be given, is given to be in you, for you, of course. But more than that, it is given to you to be given away in a radically inclusive way, in the outpouring, self-emptying way of the three persons of the Trinity Welling up and spilling over, it's an endless waterfall. Welling up and spilling over, over all. Thanks be to God, and the blessing of Pentecost be upon him. Amen. Amen. Amen.